And welcome back, everybody. Uh, we have another great speaker here today. We've got Al Itkin here to talk about light bulb security. How's it going, Al? Fine. How are you? I'm doing okay. We also have my co-goon here, Sigad. Hey, Sigad, how's it going? So, uh, Al, can you kind of just take a minute and maybe give like a brief introduction of yourself and the presentation that you gave that people can go watch on DEF CON? Yes. So, um, hi, I'm Al. I'm a vulnerability researcher. i um, usually focus on embedded devices and network protocols. And this is a classic research in which I combine them both together to hack some, in this case, small device. Um, essentially, in our research, we continued the previous research by uh, two uh, great researchers, Al Ronen and Colin O'Flynn. And they showed how they can take over a smart light bulb and propagate from one light bulb to the other. And our goal in this research was to take it one step uh, further. We wanted to take over a light bulb and then from the light bulb take over the smart controller. And the controller is connected to both the radio network, the Zigbee network, and to the regular computer network um, so we could manage our smart light bulbs from our mobile app, for example. This basically means that using a malicious light bulb or an antenna, we could take over the uh, controller and then infiltrate the network and attack computers inside it. So we only need a radio antenna and then we can uh, infiltrate your home or your office uh, network. So that was the goal and this is what we demonstrated. That's excellent. All right. Um, so I, I know in your presentation, you kind of mentioned a whole bunch of the uh, people's research uh, that you based yours off of. Uh, what got you interested in this kind of thing? Uh, what made you want to look into trying to take things one step further from how what the, the other research that previous people did? Okay, so it was quite simple. Um, one of the researchers, Al Ronen, is an old colleague of mine. And when he started working on his initial research, uh, roughly four years ago, it was the first time I actually heard of smart light bulbs. And I really didn't know why people need smart light bulbs because I really only need the light when I'm physically in the room. And I'm physically capable of toggling on and off the switch. So I don't really know why I need an app in order to control the light in the room that I'm currently in. Um, and I figured it out that smart light bulbs uh, won't be a real thing. People won't buy it and forgot about it uh, and uh, continued on with my life. Um, but it turns out that people actually buy uh, smart lighting solutions. It turns out that a lot of people sp specifically in the UK uh, use it. It's not so popular uh, here uh, in Israel. So Eyal Ronen talked with me again, and he said, uh, we have an opportunity, opportunity to continue on our um, research because we had an additional task that we couldn't complete in our research. And since it turns out that people actually use smart light bulbs, and in previous DEF CON talks, we infiltrated the network using a fax machine, it turns out that it could be interesting to do that over the radio as well, uh, over Zigbee. So this was the goal. We uh, collaborated with the previous research team to get their equipment and uh, knowledge from their uh, results. And then we started on on our way. Awesome. That's all great stuff. Sigat, do we have any questions coming in yet, or did you have any? Not sure if he's hearing me at all over there. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay, go for it. Uh, no, there's a, there's a, well, comment that says, I hope you got a bounty for showing that the strings weren't completely Im implemented. <laughs> we I didn't get the, the second, uh, uh, the second part of the, uh, of the patch that you, you tested, right? Yeah. Um, we didn't get any bounty. I mean, we usually don't get any bounty. Um, I never worked on an embedded research which we received any bounty on any vulnerability whatsoever. Um, 
usually even when we report the vulnerabilities, if they are only partially fixed or only the crucial uh, vulnerabilities are actually patched. So uh, for example, our vulnerability uh, was that we were able to show that in previous versions, there were arrays which weren't parsed correctly. And in newer version, they migrated to strings, but behind the scenes, they're still using them as arrays with the same old vulnerability. So the patch was to check the sizes of the arrays and handle them correctly instead of treating them as strings because strings are handled correctly and we only can send strings over the radio. So there's no reason to treat them internally as arrays as just because someone did it three years ago and that's the code. But it's harder to fix it on a big uh, design issue than just adding an if in the code and that's it. So one of the questions that we see coming in from, looks like, uh, Jiska. Did you get any further with the Zigbee modem itself? Like, were you able to extract its firmware? Um, it's a good question. The problem we had with the Zigbee modem is that the firmware update is encrypted. Um, and in a previous research, what they did was they had a power analysis attack and they extracted the key and decrypted a firmware update and signed their own firmware update. Um, but it was only applicable for the firmware to the light bulbs themselves. And it turns out that the modem uses a bit different uh, cryptographic scheme. So we had to, if we wished to get the firmware of the modem, we had to reiterate all of the research uh, that uh, the previous research team did. And we didn't have the resources for that at the time. So we tried to live with it as a black box and we managed. Uh, it could be interesting to look on it because it's more advanced than the light bulb itself. It does more uh, functionality. Uh, but no, we don't have the film, sadly. Okay. Yeah, I think in your presentation, you mentioned that previously, uh, before your research, it was kind of thought the worst things that you could do was like turn all the light bulbs on or turn all the light bulbs off or flicker them or anything like that. So now based on the research that you did, what do you see as kind of a worst case scenario if somebody wanted to do bad things with your research? Um, the classic scenario we thought about is either a neighbor attacking uh, your network or someone parking a large van across the street and deploying an attack. And then it, we can easily hijack a given light bulb and convince it to connect to our network. And then as you show in the demo, um, if you turn off the light bulb, you think that it's broken and you just toss it away. And instead, we change the color so you'll know that something is wrong with your light bulb and try to reset it. But there's no reset button. Um, there's no buttons at all to the light bulb. So the only way to reset the light bulb is to delete it from the app and then search for new light bulbs. And when you search for new light bulbs, we can actually attack your controller and infiltrate the network. So once we take over the controller, we are inside your uh, home network or your office network we can attack whichever computer we, we wish. We can sniff the traffic. And if inside your own network, you use a HTTP instead of HTTPS, we can sniff all of your uh, traffic. And essentially, no one will notice uh, an intruder on the bridge. You don't have an antivirus on your bridge. Uh, you don't have any security solution on it. So we can have a persistent foothold inside your network and attack additional computers and just from being near your network with an antenna for five minutes. Wow. So knowing what you know now from this exploit, what would you suggest to the makers of IoT devices? Um, specifically in this case, there were some security mitigations in place, which is sadly quite rare. Usually we get none. Um, and still, although there were some security mitigations, we we're still able to exploit the vulnerability because there weren't enough uh, mitigations. And actually, after our research, 
Um, we looked again on the heap implementation that was uh, used, and we, it was really weird for us that there were some security mitigations, but because the vendors didn't compile their own binary correctly, we were able to bypass the mitigations because it turns out that if you don't have security on by default, the vendor won't compile correctly their firmware and they won't get anything because on their compiler, it's off by default. So we, in our team, we designed a new security mitigation called safe linking, and we integrated that into both glibc and uclibc uh, ng so that it will be a new security mitigation in popular malloc implementations um, and it's on by default. So just this week, glibc introduced the new version that includes uh, safe linking and uclibc already have versions with safe linking and this security mitigation uh, would have blocked our attack. It would have demanded us to have an additional uh, info leak vulnerability which we couldn't find. So nowadays vendors just need to use the most updated versions of libraries that they use. The most updated Linux version, a glibc or uclibc version, and preferably even a good compiler with a good tool chain to actually compile with security mitigations. But just updating your libc implementation will be a huge step uh, forward. Excellent. Sega, are you seeing any other questions for him coming through the, the Discord channel at uh, Track 1 Live QA? So we have one. Uh, uh, so your discovery was a modern firmware security problem or just a Zigbee protocol issue? Uh, it turns out that Zigbee is complex, which wasn't um, a big surprise. But the vulnerability itself was an implementation vulnerability specific to that product. So uh, Philips, now Signify, had an implementation vulnerability over the years. It changed a bit over the firmware versions, but essentially it was an implementation vulnerability on their side. It wasn't a vulnerability on Zigbee. Um, that said, Zigbee defines uh, data types with variable lengths that should be received over the network. And usually embedded devices and embedded developers are not that good with handling variable sized uh, objects. Although there was no vulnerability in Zigbee, but only in the implementation, I can guess that if five developers will have to implement this model, at least two of them will get it wrong. So um, it still should be done correctly. So have you checked the updated bridge firmware, like if they used more mitigations? Uh, we checked the updated firmware version for the patch, so we would know how did they uh, actually fix it and to check that they fixed it correctly so we could continue on with the publication. Um, we only saw a small patch, as I said earlier, just an additional if check. We didn't notice any change in the compilation or anything of this sort. Um, if they are here in this Twitch, I really urge them to update their libc version and compile uh, to use dynamic addresses instead of static addresses. This will be a huge step uh, forward in the security of the device. That's great. Uh, let's see, what else do we have coming through over there? Anything else, uh, Sigad? No, I'll, uh, I'll ask you a question. Though. Awesome. I, I noticed when, uh, you know, in your talk, you, uh, you, you spoke a lot about your, your sort of false starts, right? And, and that you, you know, you tried this, you tried that. Um, and, uh, you know, th this, these didn't work out and those didn't work out. And then you also kind of, uh, mentioned, uh, hitting a wall on the, uh, on the arrays issue. Um, before you were able to, you know, to find the, the second implementation that that uh, that still contained the vulnerability. Um, so two questions. One was just, uh, uh, you know, what about those uh, false starts? Did you think were important enough to include in the uh, in the talk? And secondly, uh, you know, what what got you uh, to to the thinking that got you past that wall? Okay, so I started the first one. Um, 
without the false starts, I wouldn't have been able to actually find the vulnerability that eventually I found and to uh, reliably exploit it. Because even um, as in the slides, it didn't even have enough time in the blog post, uh, which was just uploaded. You can see that there was an additional false vulnerability, uh, but there is a vulnerability, but it isn't exploitable. And even if I wouldn't have uh, encountered this uh, code module and the treatment of uh, Zigbee addresses and the Zigbee phone book, uh, which initially had a vulnerability, but which wasn't exploitable, I wouldn't have been able to uh, understand where to store the shell code and how to construct my shell code and how to use it. So every part in this research, even if I didn't eventually find a vulnerability in this specific model, but I tried to, um, I learned a few things about the device and about the memory layout. And every one of them was important in the overall attack at the end. So that was the main reason I decided to talk about all of the steps in the research, even if there were some dead ends, because it gives an additional information that we later on use uh, during the exploit. So it was important um, about hitting the wall. Then when you start a research with a, an interesting attack vector and you're already into it, you, you got the firmware, it's loaded into your disassembler, you bought a, a kit with the hardware, you have everything, uh, you really want to find vulnerabilities. Um, and in most of the projects that I worked on, there are critical vulnerabilities. We just need to find them. So you check one module, it's a dead end. You go to the other one, it's a dead end. You go to the third one, it's a dead end. And then you uh, go back and you check your initial assumptions. Maybe there is some assumption that we uh, thought about, but it's wrong. The device might behave different. Uh, maybe we skipped a module because it looked well written, but we didn't check it deeply enough. So we can go back to that module and test it again. So essentially in a security research, we uh, attack the device in layers. We want to find the path of least resistance and it's really common to reiterate over the same module again and again, because now we want to go deep into that module after we had a shallow look on all of the modules uh, we initially marked. So uh, we have a few iterations. We, most of the times we find critical vulnerabilities. Um, it's not easy to continue on when you get to a dead end and when you get to multiple dead ends, um, but you're all already into it and you, you don't, not want to uh, raise a white flag and surrender and to the research team in the office to laugh about you. So you want to continue on, you want to prove that you actually can break this device. Uh, and it's really important not to, uh, never to give up. That sounds like there might be a little bit of an <clears throat> extra story there about being laughed at in the office, but certainly not one that we can need to talk about today. <laughs> um, were you ever able to find a way to overcome the 60 second limit in the exploit? Uh, sadly, no. Um, technically, there is a grace period that once the user requested a bridge to search for new light bulbs, we have roughly 60 seconds. In some experiments, it wasn't exactly 60 seconds and it looked more like two minutes, but um, essentially there's a timer, most probably some thread uh, on the main CPU uh, initiates a timer and when a timer expires, a message is sent to the modem and the modem shuts down the communication. So unless we starve the thread uh, that is responsible for the timer, uh, the timer will expire and we will be blocked out. And it is a good security design. 
we can't uh, send messages to the bridge um, unless the user requested the bridge to look for new light bulbs. So it is a good design. It blocks most of the attack vector. However, there's no reset button for the light bulbs. And there's no indication of, please just pair this light bulb again, according to the addresses of the light bulb. So essentially the design started quite good, but broke somewhere in the middle. Um, we did find out that if we bomb the controller with multiple messages, we can starve the rest of the threads. Um, but it has some disadvantages as well, because if we starve the rest of the thread, then the watchdog will restart the bridge. And we mostly uh, don't want that to happen. Um, so the 60 seconds is, it is a hard uh, limit. We can't really do a lot about it. Excellent. So yeah, do we have anything else currently coming through the Discord yeah, chat? So we have a we have a question. Uh, did you start working on IoT exploitation at Checkpoint, or is this an area you've been working on beforehand? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, it really depends how you define IoT. Uh, if IoT is anything uh, that is not Windows, Linux, or uh, mobile, then I started working on embedded devices practically for my first year on, uh, on work. Um, if we rule out uh, network equipment, for example, uh, then actual embedded devices were from after three or four years of work. So it wasn't the first device that I encounter encountered, but I did uh, research embedded devices uh, way before I started uh, working on checkpoints or such. Excellent. And did you ever think of attempting to brick the other bulbs or possibly the controller? Uh, there is a sad story about that because <laughs> if you brick the device, uh, you also lose your own device. And then you need to go and purchase a new device and convince some manager to once again buy it. And then you need to tell the manager, yeah, we need to buy it again because we bricked the earlier one. And you can't do that often. Um, we had that on the research on the previous year. Uh, we presented a DEF CON ransomware on uh, DSLR cameras. And we had to test the patch from the vendor. But if the patch will work, we'll get uh, locked out from the device and we won't be able to demonstrate the attack, which we wanted to demonstrate on a live demo. So uh, once we noticed that it will be some uh, issue about it, we went to buy an additional camera. So if we lose one of them, we still had a backup. So it is uh, quite easy to break the devices. And most of the times you don't want to do that because you lose your own research device and you need to uh, buy a new one. A few years ago, I actually bricked my device uh, on a, a different research project. And if you break your device, then people really laugh because, um, yeah, he bricked his device. We need to buy a new one. And you don't want to be that researcher. So you really don't want to break your own device. Sounds like quite the environment at work that you have there. Uh, <laughs> so it seems like a lot of times, a lot of years at DEF CON, you know, the big story comes out about this big thing is insecure. There's going to be these problems. And you're talking about how that people could get into a home network or maybe even a, a business network through a light bulb. Uh, so what do you think about overall security concerns based on your research? Is this something that uh, people at large should be really concerned about or is it being handled really well by the manufacturers? Um, I wouldn't trust the manufacturers at all, specifically in IoT devices. Um, it doesn't look like they, like security is a top priority in their devices. Um, if we look specifically on the light bulbs case, I would be more worried about a neighbor uh, hijacking all of my light bulbs and turning them to um, whichever color they want, because they could have done that years ago 
even from the conclusions of the previous researchers. And it's a flaw in Zigbee. You can't fix that. So specifically in light bulbs, anyone can hijack your light bulb and steal them to control them from their own uh, network. And you, there's nothing really you, you can do about that. If you're worried about someone attacking your bridge and infiltrating your network, most probably uh, it won't happen a lot. Um, we are not releasing our full exploit and we work quite hard on the exploit so it will be reliable and uh, will work correctly. Um, if you're a real target, and some high uh, um, authority wants to hijack your network, they could do that. Will uh, someone do that to your neighbor? Most probably not. That uh, said on the light bulbs. Um, uh, two years ago, we showed you we can hijack and infiltrate the network from a fax machine. And then the attack was easier, more reliable, and I can be in China and still attack your uh, all-in-one printer. So uh, that one is more concerning. Um, and I would worry more about using a fax than using smart light bulbs. Excellent. Sigad, how are we doing with that Discord channel there? Coming up with anything else? Or should we kind of start giving him some wrap-up questions? So we had one one question about uh, did this research ever give you the uh, kind of insight uh, you started out with on why uh, people want connected light bulbs? Uh, actually, it did. Uh, it turns out that um, smart light bulbs are actually quite cool. Uh, I read about a few people in the north which use the light bulbs and calibrate them uh, to match the season and the clock, so they will still get sunrise and sunset, even if they don't actually have that uh, way in the north um, because of the season. Uh, you have quite a lot of control over the light bulb, uh, both the intensity and the uh, color itself, and you can sync multiple light bulbs to get a scene. Um, and it is really cool. Uh, it isn't very practical because, for example, if there is a power shutdown, then all of your light bulbs uh, go reset, and then you lose all your all of your scheme, all of the colors, and all of the te intensity, and you get all of the light bulbs go white, go to the maximum uh, lighting, and it happens quite a lot. The power has some sort of glitch, and you're not supposed to connect your light bulbs to a backup system or to a UPS or anything of this sort. So if you're really into the colors of the light bulbs, uh, you need to have pretty good uh, electricity in your city or in your uh, state. Yeah, otherwise, you need to recalibrate your light bulbs again and again. And that's quite uh, annoying. That's great. <clears throat> uh, so what would be your one main takeaway from your research or call to action, what would you like to see uh, to happen after this? What should people take away from your, your research and your presentation? So if I uh, have a message to manufacturers, then please compile with security mitigations and use the latest versions of each library. It really adds a large amount of security. If it's for researchers, then it turns out that practically any device that you can think of using any protocol will most probably still be vulnerable. On Zigbee, we have a maximal uh, transmission unit of 127 bytes, and we still reliably exploited the vulnerability. So even with really harsh constraints and really esoteric protocols, we can still consistently year over year present in DEF CON that we broke an additional device. So everything practically could be uh, broken. And even if you have harsh constraints, you most probably will still be able to exploit a vulnerability once you find it. So um, if you pick a target, don't give up. 
most probably you could get a win out of your research. So um, just try hard enough. Let's slide one last question in there for you from Brief Halo. What recommendations would you give to someone interested in studying IoT exploitation formally, like at a university? Uh, there are some good courses in several universities, but usually reading write-ups from researchers that um, published their research and you read about it and it, it was interesting, reading the write-ups usually gets you a lot of tips. So. If you read uh, publications from Colin O'Flynn, you get a lot of new knowledge about hardware and how UART works and how UBoot works, and you can learn a lot from practical write-ups of researchers. Uh, it will be more practical than most of the courses uh, in many universities. That's great. All right. Thank you so much for doing this. This was a great talk with you. I really enjoyed your presentation as well. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you. All right. Have a good night, and we will be back in about 30 minutes with another speaker.